Thanks. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to thank you for joining me today to hear from our exhibiting artist, Tom Scullin, who is also a PCAD founder. And whether it be helping to start a small school in 1982 and helping it grow to the PCAD we know and love today, or exploring optical perspective to learning new technologies, Tom is always moving forward, learning new things and experimenting in his work. A sampling of 40 wor years worth of experiments may be seen in the gallery as part of Tom Scullin Retrospective of Paintings. If you haven't had the opportunity to check out the show, I invite you to do so at the end of this talk. So without further ado, I want to welcome Tom Scullin to the stage. Anyway, um, I want to thank everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. I have a trick. If anybody's falling asleep, I get closer and closer to them. So um, you're part of my guinea pigs, my, one of my grand experiments by being here. I want to thank you for coming. And I want to thank Highland for helping out with uh, scanning slides that had plenty of dust all over them. Uh, ancient technology, dinosaurs invented, known as slides. And um, President Mula for inviting me and Alex for getting a band of uh, patriots to get my show here in my infirm condition. All right. So um, we're going to start. I was 18 when I did this, pretty much the age of what you, some of you are now. And uh, it was a summer where I was basically relegated to just a, delivering papers, which was my two cents a paper summer job. And uh, I just said, in my downtime, I'm going to knock this out. So one thing about this is um, I was inspired by Wyeth and people like Dolly, Vermeer, and that was my, if you want to say, uh, grinding. But also I did things, uh, Rauschenbergish, if you want to call it, I-S-H, uh, different other artists that were more experimental, expressionist. So this is just a representation of the fact I wanted to nail a representational style. And even at this stage, I think there's some kind of allegory going on. You got the ice skate with liquid water. Um, also, at one point in time, the entire background was as dark as the shadows. And I didn't like it, so I just took out a scouring pad and invented those uh, shadows. So that's my way of saying, roll the punches. You may start out somewhere, you end up somewhere else. Uh, when I went to college, I went for biochemistry. I run a lot of science fair projects. At a, I didn't have a stellar GPA, but I got a scholarship enough to uh, I guess go into that major. My twin brother uh, jumped the boat and immediately went into the arts. He went into printmaking slash art history. And I saw him having more fun than a bunch of Bunsen burners and scales that were supposedly to work that didn't work and things like that. So I hopped the gun. I, I went into um, art. And I did a lot of experimental projects. So this is one. Um, so maybe. Sometimes you do something and it's a premonition of things that may go on years past, or in the future rather. So I saw this as a bunch of aberrations and I saw some kind of emanations. It's a transfer print. Uh, then I did some visionary landscapes. Uh, this is strictly from my head, very textural, again, scrub surfaces like the background. Uh, I just saw it in my mind's eye, some kind of paradise. Though an invaluable thing for me was Ohio State University had stacks. And I'm talking about a couple thousand books. And you could do a whole row of images, pull a book open, flip it open, go to the next book, put it back, put it back, put it back. Maybe I have a book I like. I, pull, I leave it pulled out. Then I check out. I scour them. Then I check that batch out. So I would see literally uh, about 10,000 images come across things I couldn't even imagine. So I took an early liking to the Hudson River School of Painting. And I invented this landscape. I saw it as a bunch of muscle masses. Uh, it's kind of based on Ernst Fuch, who is a very um, obscure artist, uh, German uh, Viennese expressionist, uh, magic realist. Uh, so this is a bunch of muscle masses as landscape, essentially. Uh, another aspect of things I was dealing with was I would do the erosion of surface of something, trying to imagine the way water would carve that surface, and that was the first take, and then I'd repaint it and repaint it. 
So it didn't matter what I did before. I just had to suck it up and say, well, that doesn't look right. And so all this, again, detail would have been painted over three times differently. So uh, it was kind of based on, this is the very first thing I did in art school. My one teacher said, yeah, that's great. And then from that point on, I never said anything. So uh, that goes to show, but I, I had this contrapuntal feeling for composition and masses of landscape form. I was doing prints that were very experimental, so this would be a, a serigraphy, silk screen, a split fountain technique. Again, uh, another aspect, this is kind of a predictor of things to come, was energy forces. I, I saw like cosmic energy forces. Still kind of interesting, I did the circle thing, now I'm doing a still life. Um, and I, I did a lot of still lives in the vein of uh, Magritte. As usual, in art school, you do figure drawings. I'm just throwing that in there. I did this, again, as an energy field exploration, something of masses of energy coming from a force. Uh, it's, it's a intaglio with, uh, I forget the terminology, but it has multiple plates. I've got another visionary work. I just thought of a dream of a dragon. The inner couple of figures is from Ernst Fuchs again. Uh, but it's, I wanted the wing to be a foil. I have that scoured surface of the sky, uh, the land mass behind there. I uh, just wanted to ornament the dragon in a magical way. This is a, a painting that, uh, again, I see these still life objects as having meaning. So there's an upside down statue of the Pieta, and then there's a crack, and that's all based on some. I would call a mad person that cracked off her arm at the time, and so that's where the crack is. And then I have my sister's first painted, then I have an eye patch. Uh, then it dried out a little bit of paint tray. And while I was doing this, I uh, kind of almost had a mental breakdown. I painted the paint tray and actually, you know, broke down and cried. I said, why the hell am I doing this? This is like impossible. But then I repainted it and repainted it so the paint tray looked like a dried paint on an aluminum paint tray. It reminded me of an oriental landscape. Another one of these uh, quasi self portraits. I found out that um, a person purchased this uh, while it was in Columbus, lives here, maybe about four years ago. They said, uh, Is that Tom Scullin? And they said, Well, I got your painting 40 years ago, actually more than 40 years ago while I was at Ohio State. And they trucked that painting all the way here. It's pretty close to the size it is. So just a hubcap, self-portrait, old TV. Um, I did some things involving distortion. I was interested in optics. And Vermeer did a camera obscura, which is basically a slide projector, just a mirror and a lens. And the Beatles did a rubber sole, where they took an album cover and they stretched it out. So I, I did like an alley couple. Uh, elderly couples in Arizona. I saw this as almost like a hearse death car. Uh, the, the red table is kind of like life, but these are pretty much dead people in a, a landscape. Uh, I did this as an experiment involving, uh, when I went to grad school, I went to Penn State, uh, just optics where I had tinsel that was literally as close as this microphone is to my, my eyes, so it became totally out of focus. And it was sitting on the uh, pedestals. And I was interested in binocular vision and also the, um, what I thought had never been recorded, the actual highlights you would see of something out of focus, which is very prismatic. Uh, if you look at something of uh, photography, it just blobs. Uh, but if you ever see things, uh, one of my favorite visual phenomena is in a dentist office while you're waiting there and there's weird lights and highlights and all that. So I wanted to record that. I said, well, you know, in all the history of art, no one's actually recorded a highlight the way you actually see it. Uh, there's a lot of scintillation. There's prismatics that occur on the edges. And there's something of the binocular vision. So another experiment. This is, um, I forget what it's called, uh, anamorphic. Uh, cylindrical anamorphic. You just graph it out, stretch it. So it's Vermeer. Uh, a bit on album cover when you were someone else, an old Edison record. Uh, but the Vermeer Artist Studio kind of stretches all the way around as a spiral to the beginning. Uh, but that's the reflection. Um, so the cylinder in the middle, you can see the cylinder. 
And basically, the cylinder corrects the distortion. It's a, an optical trick. Uh, that's going back to undergrad school for some reason, it's mixed potatoes, but basically you're looking at um, a camera obscura here. And I was in the artist studio, or actually the classroom, and I just set up the box with the projection, and I painted it, it's very uh, painterly. Another, again, this is not in grad school, this is scrambled eggs, it's not chronological. Um, I did the experiment of just doing a monocular vision or view of my room, so that's probably the first time I did curvilinear perspective, which is you can see any time, just look around, things curve. And of course, then I got my famous nose, and then um, I did the cat and the mirror trick. So I'm painting the painting of the painting of the painting of the painting. So we actually saw that earlier with the uh, computer. Optical experiment, there's a upside down blue, or sorry, spoon directly maybe inches away from my eyes, so then you get those highlights, not Vermeerian globules, they, they're very prismatic. Uh, again, we never want any self-portraits, me in a paint can, but then I have binocular disparity. Things get more doubled as you get further and further away from the spoon, so there's probably, the only place that's in focus, it would probably be the reflection. Everything gets doubled in front and behind, so I put up a glass piece of glass with gridded on, and then I carefully measure the optical disparity between my eyes uh, to be accurate for the center vision. Uh, another one of these camera obscura runs very, uh, another one of these optical experiments involving a globule very close to my eyes. So through one eye, I see it head on. Through the other eye, I see it at an angle. Uh, the actual view is toward the very top where you see me next to the globule. A uh, piece of I guess rope, or sorry, some kind of stick holding up the uh, apparatus, if you want to call it that. Uh, kind of the end point, where I just had a gigantic lens in front of my eyes, and I was really worried about going blind. Because <laughs> I had, I was looking at this stuff for hours on end, and I'm looking at all these reflections, and all these blurry things, and all these things being doubled, and, and it's just, you know, it just became pure optical phenomena. But I, I love the idea of the immateriality of form, uh, with this optical situation. So here, uh, in grad school, I decided to just go with um, some of the photorealist technique of just recording data. So I, I had a butcher's convention in Chicago. Uh, so I just gritted it off and then did it on black paper with reflective silver. So it became just a fun exercise in visual recording. I, I saw it as being like uh, the last shot of The Shining where they show um, you know, Jack Nicholson sitting above all, uh, sitting in the crowd. I kind of just got sick of the, uh, this is one thing as an artist, you kind of say, well, I'm driving myself either crazy or bored, so I'm just going to flip to something else. So I just decided to be a conventional still life artist, but I uh, wanted the quizzical juxtapositions of something weird. So this was a gigantic lens that was very thick that somehow got a prismatic, uh, break on it, and then I have Vermeer, and again, the Vermeer is distorted with one view, and then it's corrected with the others, which is referring back to the anamorphic thing, and a kind of a box, magical box, and then this evolutionary chart that is torn by the box, and then a chandelier, and then the parchment, which is kind of like a sacred parchment, like the Dead Sea Scrolls at the very top, and a, kind of a regal, so all these things get invested with meaning, as, so I see it as like evolution as a crack and blah, blah, blah. Then you have luxury and all that attached to it. Another one of these kind of piling up of surfaces and uh, magical uh, things, a map, uh, very prismatic, I guess, uh, I forget, iridescent insect, uh, mylar, battle box, Vermeer's lace maker, another woman in the hat. Um, so all these are just compiled objects. Originally, I did this horizontally, flipped 90 degrees, but then I said, oh, it looks better flipped that way because the um, mirror became sort of a, a halo. Hopefully, I'm pressing this right. Another one of these explorations of juxtaposition. So these are just still lives. I saw the, um, an old gardening with the plants, and you think, well, the plants are all dead. These people are all dead. So it just became, and then I had this, um, at Ohio State, they had this old observatory that was defunct, so I crawled in the window and grabbed something at the base of the, uh, the telescope and 
you know, urban exploration. So I carried that with me and then this sort of magical object that would have been bulldozed under. Uh, just quasi still life. It's just, um, you know, I lived in an apartment that was cold, so I just actually put plastic over the front door and then it became sort of a Mondrian exercise of visual balance, the uh, light switch has to counterbalance all those forces that cascade from the bottom right to the, you know, all along the left side. You got, don't even have curtain rods. They have uh, actual rope for the curtain rods. So just a, and plus you have the prismatic reflection of the old glass. How many people have ever seen old glass that has prismatic reflections? It's a very kind of magical thing. Uh, I did these stellars that, uh, if you ever know old paintings, there's something called Sacred Conversations. They show Mary and Joseph, and then they show all these other patrons and all these other saints. So I saw these still lives as Sacred Conversations. There's one mirror, which represented, I guess, a female or male, I don't know what, and then another one, then a broken lens holder, and then sort of a very truncated pyramid with this, uh, all these things sort of compiled. Then you have the cacophony of the just different surfaces of the wood, of the chiffon that's translucent. So this is a jumble of visual forces. Sort of, uh, this is the end point of uh, toward my graduate school and I was frying my brain on uh, coffee, sort of bad diet. So I'd spend like an infinite amount of time painting these fabrics, uh, each one of those individual grids of the fabric have a complex grid texture inside it and then just sort of, you know, like an ant going piece by piece by piece uh, through the entire thing just to get it right. Um, and it's sort of a, a similar situation. Uh, Fabridius is one of my favorite artists. How many people know Fabridius? Anyway, Carl Fabridius did these paintings of uh, figures or goldfinches, his most famous painting. And it has a light background, and I just decided, well, you know, normal still life, dark background, light background instead. But then it became a, an exercise of visual mapping. I just said, well, this is a very complicated situation. Uh, can I actually paint it? And so I just set about doing it, and I got it wrong a few times. I just had a flexi curve to do the curves of the weave, and then he had the shadow behind the basket versus when it was flush with the wall. And then can you get the weave of the basket that's lying down, da da da. So just, I just kind of set it up as a uh, visual challenge. Uh, that's kind of a detail. And I don't know if any of it's right. You know, I, I never wove a basket in my life. Um, room interior is kind of the same thing. Just a layering of, of pattern upon pattern. So I'm standing there. You get a little bit of the curvilinear perspective of the vertical jam of the I guess doorway on the right hand side, but then it's sort of opening upon opening upon opening. You've got the open box, the open window, the open door. And then you have floral patterns, the wallpaper, the bed sheet. So you're dealing with all kinds of things. Very subdued color, just a few bright highlights here and there. Part of the same thing, uh, just an exercise in visual balance, that chair dramatically cropped. What's going to keep that from falling off the edge of the earth? Well, just that strip of the red carpet. Then you got the reflectivity of the red on the wall. Then you have the chessboard, sort of a triangulation between the chair, the chessboard, and the architecture in the bottom, sort of toward the bottom right. So you're dealing with all these architectural forces. Uh, the density of pattern, the pattern of the, of the chair pattern, of the you know, chess pattern, of the curtain pattern, of the uh, sort of jumbo pattern of the architecture outside, and then the solidity of the wall in the carpet. Uh, Curvilating a perspective on the, again, another one of these still lives that have a self-portrait, I'm in the spiral, uh, but you have the curvilating a perspective, and then uh, it's looking forward and looking down, also you have the, what is very dull for the reflection versus what's super sharp, which is the objects. Uh, not only the end points, I was totally fried on uh, textures, totally fried on glass, totally fried on, uh, it's kind of like my brain at the time, everything was crackled up. Uh, so I started teaching at York Academy of Art, it was uh, basically uh, for four years, and uh, actually anatomy here is very strange, my hand's too small, my legs are too far apart, maybe I got them chopped up. 
Uh, but basically, I was in an environment, very crappy apartment. Uh, Cockroaches is where my friends. Uh, you can see all, all the, uh, you know, what is a plastic curtain and anything else kind of treated with the same uh, notion of being sacred as a Van Eyck. I'm just uh, saying, well, this is me, this is that. Somehow in the universe, it all came together for me to be there. Who knows? So um, I did all of these weird interiors. It's just a chronicle of visual perspective. And sometimes I'm looking straight. Sometimes I'm looking up. Sometimes I'm looking sideways. Also, there's something here about the, the uh, temperature of light, uh, the translucency or reflectivity of the marble fireplace versus the sheen of the parquet floor. And, you know, it's just um, sort of a theatrical seeing if you can capture light in all these weird environments, but also perspective. Uh, I don't particularly like this, but at least my legs came together. <laughs> just just really sitting with a, a goofy uh, leather jacket. And there's my uh, first wife sitting there, uh, uh, curving your perspective. Oh, this is in the show, so this probably, I'm dating 81, I think, or sorry, yeah, around there, I don't know. And um, that couch <laughs> finally bit the dust, had a few cigarette burns in it. Uh, you can see the actual painting itself is on the left-hand side, so it's very important to eyeball it. The, the carpet took forever, if you look at it in the show. And back then, I had the actual framing uh, support of the vacuum form plastic. So again, it harkens on Van Eyck, I guess, a little bit. Uh, but the carpet is probably the main thing that did me in. <laughs> Just all those little fragments of the carpet. Plus, uh, working out the perspective lines on the carpet on my shoulder. So that's the actual form. And I, I did this originally with the idea that um, it would reflect light totally if that were on the surface. And I did it in egg tempera. So this is one of my uh, bodyscapes. I'll describe it as in going back to the idea that no one ever painted anything like this before. So I'm lying down and I'm just saying, well, you know, this is what you see in any one moment. Uh, so my graduate thesis was called uh, Physiological Visual Perception in Art, which is a fancy way of saying just record what you see and not what you think or interpret uh, psychologically. So basically I was lying on the couch. I said, no one's ever recorded the same way, no one's ever recorded the side of their nose or their hand or the body and all these dramatic... So now they have Go GoPro that can do all that. I always wanted to do uh, more intimate views or something different. Uh, maybe the secondary aspect of this is everybody staring out the window for something to do. Uh, kind of flipping through things, maybe non-sequentially, another one of these um, explorations of greys, also a visual perspective. Uh, this is probably just conventional one-point perspective, nothing going on there. Uh, I wanted to do a painting of a toilet. <laughs> All right, so I said, no one's ever done a painting of a toilet. This is in the show. Uh, again, kind of the same, is this man like presence, you know, is that orange as sacred as the one in the Van Eyck painting or I got an egg there and it's a shabby apartment. Uh, but I was there, living there, because my guy actually uh, almost fell through that bathroom ceiling, you know, an open door. There's escaping police. So uh, I saw those balls and I opened the door and said, he's going that way, you know, toward my bathroom is about to crash through. So it's, it's a long, long story. Uh, that's in the show. I pretty much painted it lying down. I don't know how I did it. Um, and I originally had paintings on a wall and then I said, well, let's make this kind of a much more minimal sort of contemplative thing. This is my stupid couch. Glad I got rid of it. Uh, not all these curvilinear perspectives, my old friend Vermeer. I did this one sitting on, I got a real sore butt. So I just had to eyeball everything. Now I know the <coughs> tiles on the floor are impossible. There's no way there's that many tiles in a place. But somehow I came up with that formula. Uh, I think that's enough tiles for maybe about 10 more rooms, I don't know. Not the time I was giving up smoking, so there's a poster, Freedom from Smoking Clinic. Uh, my wife is still smoking, though. Uh, so, I got sick of still lives, I got sick of interiors, I decided, let's go outside. I was living in Columbia, so I crawled around all these decrepit 
Uh, piece of architecture, this is the same road, I guess, that um, they carried debris from TMI, so maybe it'd fall off into the river and pollute our lovely, lovely system. Um, so I would just sit down. Luckily, I didn't know about Lyme's disease back then, or I knew about mosquitoes. So I did all these, just sitting down, trying to capture the scene. Um, after a while, I worked from a uh, photo reference, but this is Chickies. I was just there a couple of days. How many people have been to Chickies Rock? There you go. Very beautiful overlook. So I just fell in love with the area and the landscape and the textures of the landscape and the compositional forces of the landscape. Uh, sometimes they're almost like still lives because of details, you know, these very beautiful things. So I got accused of being just a sap of an artist because I wasn't doing anything controversial or postmodern or anything like that. Uh, but another thing, undergrad school, everybody was a dated Caulfield painter, Helen Frankenthaler. You know, that was 30 years before or 20 years before. And I was the one that was really out of it because I was doing something more traditional at times. Uh, but I kind of got the same themes of energy fields or nature as being some kind of quasi-god, goddess, if you want to call it. These architectural elements of the proud, or the proud field, or um, plus the visual phenomena aspect of, well, what happens with the ripples of the river? Again, I'm just sitting there saying, can I record it? And you know, you got reflectivity and it's all in flux. And uh, I did this sitting down in the winter. Yeah, it's very, very cold. And I did some things, a lot of things from photo reference, of course. These are very large. And uh, different moods of the river. This is somewhat more scary. Uh, I don't know how anybody wanted to buy that. But somehow it's sold. And then you got this, which is very calm and placid. So it's almost like a different schizophrenic personality. It's the same river. I love that the diaphanous mud uh, of the shore, near the shore, you know, it's very magical. Uh, so I had an opportunity to go to Ireland and I uh, did some on-site paintings there. I'd be with an umbrella. It was raining all the time, pretty much. Uh, so these became very mystical places. Uh, again, this is smattering of different landscapes. Some of it's from photo reference. I became intrigued, since I worked with the highlights of the tinsel and things, I became intrigued with um, just the brightness of sunshine. So I just wanted to capture the prismatic aspect of how bright sun could be. Or else, just the complexities of textures and landscape, the bizarreness of forms, these eroded forms on the river. If you've ever been to Falmouth, it's a beautiful place on the river. Uh, another one is on site. This again is a little bit of scrambled eggs. <coughs> Not to repeat that phrase too many times, but basically I was just there painting in an afternoon, kind of got this done in about five hours. Versus the photo reference where you got to um, really get into the textures and all that. So I uh, did a lot of panoramas, very horizontal compositions. The verticals are sort of markers, compositional proportional markers. I went with my wife to um, the Southwest for the first time and just seeing this environment, this very bizarre environment, I said, well, I'm from Pennsylvania. I think I've seen it all. <laughs> So you see these land forms, and this form here, if you're looking at this form right there, is that view there. So to get up from there to there, you got to climb all the way up now. <laughs> and I didn't go down to there, by the way. I would have been, uh, I don't think you're allowed to. I would have been dead. I would have been the fly you have to scrape off the uh, swatter. So, um, you get to see these things, and you say, wow, that's great. And I was, uh, you know, seeing things in different places, different travels. This is in Spain. Just looking at the uh, olive orchards versus chaos of the olive orchards. But going back to the Southwest, I did probably about at least 200 paintings of the Southwest. I just became engrossed with all the forms. And I'd be like Monet. Sometimes I'd paint the same scene in different lights. Of course, it's in realism. It's not like Monet. Um, just a lesson, and I, I should have shown before and afters, this basically had a much more complicated sky, and then just repaint it, repaint it to something much more metaphysical, I guess. Um, it's a very nice place near um, Monument Valley. Uh, 
Uh, every once in a while I do fantasies from my head. This is sort of the cosmic force of lava, moon. Uh, another one is very, very simplified forms. The original reference is 50 times more complicated, and I kept on repainting it, repainting it till I got some, some resolution of the cascades or the uh, proportional force from horizontal to um, strata. So it became much more. One of my earliest dish forms for the landscapes, just kind of dealing with the skin of reflectivity of the water versus translucency of the water, the textures of the rock. Uh, this very large proportional painting, I think it's 18 by 8. Uh, that's me, I guess, way back when. And um, it's on a curved surface, so I stretched canvas where the template of the canvas gave me that curve. So it's a river scene. That's more or less straight on. Unfortunately, it's, I don't have any color view of that. So this is the largest dish form. And uh, just showing you how the beginning stage of it, I have an ellipse, then I hang a chain, and it touches the middle. And then I put on the spines, then I put on the laminates of uh, some kind of, what is it called, I forget. It's some kind of plastic thing you use for surface of a wall. You can bend. Then I surface that with auto body putty, and then I have a contractor make a fiberglass mold, and they press molds from there. So um, I did a lot of these. I, I have maybe about 12, probably more. Uh, this is Hawaii, Fern Grotto. I added an allegorical figure of um, down toward the bottom of the. What? Anybody recognize that? That's right. Yeah, there you go. Tempest, Georgia Renach. Uh, that's kind of a bad cropping, but it's just uh, sometimes I do details of landscapes. For instance, waves. And another one of these, translucent versus reflectivity. There's a shark fin of a rock sticking out there. Hawaii, e, e. That's my uh, Hawaiian pronunciation. <laughs> oh, ah, e, ah, ah. Echo. I'll pretend I'm a dolphin. So... Uh, you got the bird of paradise, you got a little bird there, and you got a palm tree, maybe a kiki, kiki bar, who knows. A little umbrella in your drink. Uh, this is a painting of a rock with the uh, carved forms of the rock. I, I love these, uh, I don't know, phenomena. And I'm just playing homage to it, essentially. Of course, this is in a show. It's, I uh, have one column to work with. This column here, and then I said, "Well, let's invent a scene out of this." So I did this. I, out of my imagination, I made the rest of it, and I said, "Well, let's dress it up with more stalactites, stalagmites, any other things." So I just took out about five books, and you know, I didn't copy and paste them. I just sort of eyeballed them in the different places. I kind of have a uh, stalactite, stalactite figures right here, and then I have. Uh, quote from George uh, Delator, candlelight scene. So I'll tell you the one column, the rest of it's the composition from my imagination. Wow, okay. In the show, uh, the original writing was quite different. It was just conventional daylight, and I said, this is too boring, so I decided to make it a sunset, and then I had to imagine all the optical phenomena of that dusk situation. Wow, hopefully I'm doing, wow, sorry. I got a, a grant from the city of Lancaster to make this very large form, the same format of the uh, painting over there. So the very first painting I did was a thank you note to the city. Uh, it's called Across the Generations, and this is downtown. Uh, so I contacted all these civic and religious organizations saying, well, we want to have a representative in this painting. So I have double ACP, and then I have Buchanan off to the side, and Mennonites, Association Vietnam Veterans. Uh, I don't know if they're or then I have the uh, rabbi and then I have the Amish, of course, then I, I don't show them head on. They don't like to be uh... so I eyeballed it. I wanted to have one more figure in one spot here, I couldn't quite negotiate it. Then it gets to be a tricky uh, figure ground situation may look like they're being stepped upon, who knows? Shadow has to substitute for that. So I got eyeballed. As usual, the bricks drove me nuts. Uh, this is just one of these 
a lot of scripts were actually included figures. Normally, I, I don't throw in figures because I think the figures are uh, too sentimental, and I like the idea this is after man, before man, you know. So you're looking at basically uh, just pure landscape form, eroded form. Then I invented the, uh, if you want to call it the lighting and the clouds. The clouds are totally invented. I don't know if it makes any sense, but I just wanted something almost apocalyptic, like a time, time, uh, vortex portal. Wow. Sorry. Of course, that's why I'm here. And, uh, I don't know. That's Angel's Landing. That's where you hike to. And, uh, how many people have been to Angel's Landing? Anybody? How many people? Have been? Oh, you have. What was it like? We did it go up the narrows? Uh, we didn't actually. It was a storm that had come in. And yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, you don't get to go there and get scoured. <laughs> anyway, that's, Zion is one of my uh, favorite parks too. So that's one thing. If you go to the southwest and you hit like five national parks and maybe three national monuments, it's uh, like going to Mars. You know, don't have to have Leon. Elon Musk pay for it. Uh, that's in the show. Uh, living in one of my crappy, well, actually, this is an apartment. It's my first house. And um, I call this a tribute money because I show my uh, wife Sue to two different places. I show my twin brother across from me. And of course, I'm sitting at the table. And then I have a bird pecking a mirror. And then I have two cats in flux. But um, tribute money shows St. Peter and Christ in two different views in the same picture. So. Plus, I have this sort of Van Eyck, all-seeing God, light above it all. Wow. Uh, I didn't have this in the scene. This is one of the few pictures that I actually projected the perspective because of This is too impossible. Forgive me. <sighs> yeah, the tiles and all the colonnades. Uh, I have the visual markers, proportional horizontal mark, vertical markers of the figures from art history. So this is one of the first allegories I did. I always included an animal for relief, so I have the dog from Van Eyck, Marriage of Arnold Feeney, but also the baboon. I think the baboon is, um, God, I can't remember. Longhi, I think, has a baboon. I forget. Uh, just, again, these are all in different sequence, but that's another one in Southwest land, or Landscapes, trying to get in uh, Canyonlands, very beautiful, very desolate place. Uh, it's kind of a scary mood. Grand Canyon, of course, I repainted this a million times. I don't know if that's the latest version. Probably ruined it. So here's a, you know, I kind of got sick of landscapes. I figured, wow, well, I did the big landscapes, I did the small one. I did the fragments, I did this. I did on site, I did from photo reference. I just say, well, let's, you know, I want to say something else. And I think as an artist, you got to change around, change your subject matter, maybe change your treatment, get bored, <laughs> say, I'm not going to do this anymore, I'm kind of bored. So I just decided, well, I'm just going to throw everything to the wind. I've always been fascinated by the Kennedy assassination, then I had the landscape still going, and I just thought, well, maybe everything in time and space can coexist. Maybe you can have the Kennedy assassination and its, its ordination and the, you know, the flaming monk, you know, the monk that... Um, emulated and self-emulated uh, right before his assassination. You got DM of South Vietnam being assassinated right before Kennedy's assassination. What do you have to do with that, too? And then you have Marilyn Monroe dying the year before. What do you have to do with that, too? So um, it's all these forces, and the brain splatter is pretty much, you know, representing the entire uh, Vietnam War, you know, all the people that died there. It wasn't just Americans, about a million Vietnamese died, essentially. So that was uh, just my homage to history. So I saw myself as saying, well, let's deal with history. Let's deal with some, something of the past. So I kind of I revisited allegories. And uh, my very first venture back, and I put it to the side. Did a lot of landscape painting for a while, but I put it to the side for a good 10 years. And I uh, got a travel grant to go to Europe. And I took a lot of photos, and I said, well, the reason why I'm going to Europe is to do these allegories again. <laughs> so, well, I had to do them, because I said I would. And uh, the other thing is, I kind of overdid it the first time. I junked it up with Balthus and Cryer, I don't know, even though all the artists. Um, 
So I just threw, threw in the kitchen sink, so to speak. And as time went on, I got more and more. But the other thing is I, I became fascinated with a, a few things. One is, um, I think this is John Fouquet, or maybe I'm mispronouncing it. Uh, sort of did these monochromatic figures, and I just thought, yeah, that's, that's a nice color highlight. So later on, I just picked up on that idea of, and I have the little figurine of Venus of Billendorf, this is Dark History 101. And then I have uh, Balthus, just for something controversial, two, two Balthus quotes, you know, something very bizarre. So um, I'm kind of letting things happen gradually. Uh, this is, again, con an allegory. You're dealing with uh, the past on the bottom and on the left. The future is on the top and on the, the right. And then the middle is the present tense. And the rainbow is the intervening eye of God, sort of uh, allowing everything to flourish, but it's all going to go to hell one way or another. Uh, here you have um, just an allegory about France. Uh, Louis the Fourteenth, of course, is the proud peacock. And then you have the guillotine for fun. You have these like Louis the Sixteenth, Georgiana, uh, Tempest, things going on. And then you have a, one of these foolish kids. I think that's a quote from um, Delacroix. But he's holding a, a, a sickle, like the hammer and sickle. So he's a communist, you know, socialism and all that. And you have the ghost of people. You have fire coming out of the ground, you know, like gas leak caught on fire and very misty. And uh, Versailles is a uh, scary place, actually. It's kind of a soiled peacock. Wow. Well, wow, sorry, I'm getting it. Uh, Vatican, Deposition, Caravaggio, and all these other, Rembrandt, or Pontormo, sorry, I'm getting on my art history. Galator. Um, so I just, Wanted to juxtapose a lot of different figures, the fire, you know, things gone awry, <laughs> as you well know. Another one of these, um, Pompeii dressed up with all these art historical quotes, but um, if you want to say the exposition, you know, Adam and Eve being kicked out of paradise, Masakio. Now I'm getting into monochromatic figures, more so. Uh, magical, if you want to say, um, protuberances from the ground as well as uh, catastrophic things happening here and there, comets flying around, you know, this is all hell is going to break loose. Wow, well, sorry. I uh, may have missed one here. I've always been intrigued by, uh, you know, horrible things that happen and then people just acting like everything is normal because you can't be in touch with all the atrocities going on. So uh, there's a Vermeer next to, uh, I guess, John the Baptist. And then I like the juxtaposition of East and West. Uh, so you have Sheba with the, uh, some kind of uh, ruin, Grecian ruin. Ah, I don't know if I'm going the right way. Sorry. <clears throat> I'm getting a... Uh, one of these juxtapositions, Vermeer, carnage, lion eating another... What is it, a fox? I guess I need my glasses on the Virgin. So there's all kinds of things that are bad and things that are kind of good. So I called these, uh, there's a Fabridius's goldfinch hiding next to the statue of Bernini. Uh, so there's all, there's all kinds of bad things happening, good things. I, uh, this whole series is a sacred and profane. I, I saw it some things as being sacred, could be profane or vice versa. Along those lines, you have Thomas Jefferson, the uh, pursuits of happiness at the cost of slavery, and the original sin of slavery, again, Masakio. So um, you have the deliverance, I guess, of uh, a Blake, you know, the, the person flying from the, the uh, present universe to a, a redemptive one. Uh, just a scene in Venice. But now you have all these other characters, a baboon that becomes sacred, a Christ being cradled by a fawn, you know, some kind of pagan. Uh, so there's juxtapositions of all these forces going on in an ordinary scene. Same thing here, Flaming Monk, I've done uh, many of those. Uh, this little bouquet 
is on the site where Savonarola was burnt. So I just suppose that when you might and you have a Seder going after someone, someone dousing the Seder, and you have a flaming month behind him, you have a what is it? <clears> okay, <throat> Laurentia, uh, mother and child saying, oh my God, I gotta protect my child. Stay away from me. Another one of these, you know, Pompeii, you got the volcano, the dog that I guess is preserved as much as the corpse, Pontormo, I think that's Pont, oh, Bronzino, Bronzino. I wanna get my art history straight. I love Bronzino, I love Baltus. Um, one of these murals from uh, Pompeii, guardian figure, oriental guardian figure. So I'm doing these new ones with a lot more color, with more halos, and I'm doing them, uh, I guess is somewhat more abstract as color experiments, and they uh, much more stylized. I'm still into the architecture and juxtaposed, but um, I think I'm being sort of quasi-mystical, sort of fake mystical, almost like still Spielberg's sci-fi effects. Um, a lot of times I have to invent the background and it's very hard to figure, well, I got these figures here and now I gotta figure out what to go with behind them. Then sometimes I have a figure in there and doesn't have a belong. So then I have to bump it. It's kind of getting invited to a party and passing through a velvet rope and so eventually I find everything sort of fits together, I don't know. And I always have this feeling of erosion or things cracking apart. Um, so I just come across all these images from art history. Normally when I do a painting, I, I look through literally thousands of things and I try to figure out what goes together and if I want it. And If I have a, a landscape or something, I, I really change it drastically to get it to work or to change the clouds or the sky or something. So these are just a smattering. I, I have probably over about 150 of these allegories. I just have a representation. Same way I have more than 150 of the landscapes. And um, you can just come to your own conclusions. People might say, oh, you're saying this or you're saying that. I don't care what you think. You know, it's up to you what you think. I'm not gonna tell you what to think. I'm just coming up with things. That interest me, I'm trying to make myself awake while I look at it. <laughs> So these are kind of my latest ones. And um, I'll just say I'm, I may have some uh, similarities between them, but I'm kind of changing gradually like a glacier or some iceberg drifting through the water, maybe a cloud. I'm just a uh, walking cloud of uh, artistic creativity, right? <laughs> That's one of my latest ones. Yeah, it really drove me nuts working at that scale. So this large projection, it may look out of focus, but uh, believe it or not, that face is probably the size of my thumbnail. And of course, somehow this got quoted a lot in my PR. My dear wife passed away, so I wanted to do a uh, image involving death. And I have these color experiments that are very bizarre. <coughs> uh, magic mushrooms on the ground. And I just want to freak everybody out with this, uh, you know, what what is going on syndrome. Maybe, uh, again, I don't know if this makes any sense. I'm just kind of playing around. I have it. I have the same setting in a lot of my paintings. So I just try to dress it up with different figures, different kind of composition. Uh, I like the idea of the sky uh, just being at this challenge of what to do with it. So I just constantly test myself as to what I can have happen out there. I like this one because it, it goes to the sacred and profane a lot, sort of bestiality happening. Uh, the Red Room, one of these rooms in uh, Versailles kind of inspired this. Boucher, again, you have the juxtaposition of sacred and profane, the uh, Christian symbol of the Christ being the, the uh, fish, but also, I guess this is a quote from, uh, who is it, Bruegel, who did the fish? Uh, this is just a scene of the British Museum. Then I dress it up with St. George. They're big into St. George there. And uh, somehow St. George has his pants on fire. Here we have something going on with, again, death and life, uh, sort of a bacchanal. Again, another one of these uh, 
sacred and profane things. This is probably my first exposition of the dome. You see the dome of the Parthenon as being an all-encompassing uh, form, God, if you want to call it. So I just put that behind, I guess, the, uh, for, what is it, Trevi Fountain? Got a little unicorn there to be sort of fun. And another one of my bizarre color experiments. I don't know why I came up with those colors. I wanted to do something kind of sickening. So I just thought, well, what could be the most disturbing color? And I, I had that as an assignment. Plus I did this Wizard of Oz little uh, pavement. And just a cosmic, you know, mind blow. Special effects. Another one of these. <coughs> levitation, juxtapositions, got a, what's that thing in the top left? I forget what it's called. Anybody? It's from Durer, it's a grid. It's a magical uh, thing in the top left, num numerical sequence. Uh, Balthus, of course, is one of my favorite artists because he gets away with murder. Uh, here you have, got another one of these people being oblivious to the suffering of others. St. Sebastian versus the lace maker, busy, then got the monkeys sort of quizzically around there just for fun too. Juxtapositions. So I could just flash through these. I want to do something that was kind of oriental. They have these beautiful vases. Uh, I'm doing my proper pronunciation there. Pop, 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 uh, pop my peas. Anyway, um, they have these red backgrounds. I just thought, well, why don't I do like Matisse? I'll just have a red background and see what, see what happens. And I throw an oriental horseman in there and st stuff like that. So again, uh, sometimes I'll just have the exact same scene and I'll just do two different versions. And I'll just say, well, I did this color and I'll try that, that color. And it's kind of like a little fun before and after. Again, you've seen probably the same scene I got the same scene actually on display, but I just did it another time, another place, another. Uh, I don't like this. Uh, it's a pre-Columbian. Looks like a guy on a motor scooter, but anyway, uh, I love fun guy. Fun guy is fun. I don't want to mispronounce that. And I like spirals, uh, flames, Michelangelo's uh, Sistine Chapel, Sibyls, prophets. I've done this scene of uh, the British Museum different times. I'm, I'm working on another one version of that now, in fact. It's a San Simeon, so uh, it's on the fault line. San Simeon, the Hearst Castle. Anybody been there? Anybody been there? Anyway, they have the Olympian pool. And I just thought, well, this baby's gonna get an earthquake sooner or later. And what happens once that pool splits apart? Well, there'll be lava and then there'll be the water boiling. So you get to see the water boil. And can I, can I get that phenomena down? But as usual, you got the sacred and profane death lurking in the shadows, some fallen soldier. And again, it's kind of my uh, homage to California. It looks like I made an arrow in that halo on Augustus there. I haven't corrected yet, who knows? Death. Uh, dying Gaul, I saw the Dying Gaul as being, um, again, a poor, suffering pagan to the other pagan being the Romans. And then that's magical. How many people know Sant Ivo? Uh, I think I'm mispronouncing it, but uh, it's a Rome Borromini architecture. A uh, very beautiful spiral on the top of the cathedral. And I think that's a uh, Velasquez. So I saw these things as. Um, kind of like an homage, if you want to call it, to his death, his suffering. Uh, kind of my take on the Church of England. <laughs> Here we have, um, you know, created by Henry VIII of all people. Here we have, um, again, another one of these, death and life. Uh, I see the um, woman with the red, red hat is intellectualized sensuality or carnality, uh, but then you have the uh, an anatomy lesson of uh, Dr. Top, I think it's called. And then you have these cavorting other things, and you have this tantric art, Indian tantric art, Via Delft, uh, skyscape. 
And I did this thing, so Hitler is one of the most evil people, and I just thought, well, I wanted to do something where I sent these people to hell. If they're not in hell already, I want to make sure they're, they're damn well there now. So I painted them, and I painted their hellscapes that they created, and then I painted flames around them just to say, okay, and I, you're in hell now, now. I want you in hell. And it got Dr. Mengele, poor crying child, ovens, uh, again, Germany going all the way back to Charlemagne, World War I, Berlin Wall, Brandenburg Gate, Pol Pot, Angkor Wat, again, some of these are like evil. The uh, capture of Anne Frank, famous photograph of other Jews being captured by these evil Nazis, and then you have this will of evil and good. And, uh, and 9-11 fragment next to her, I guess that's a Vermeer, could be another Dutch artist. Uh, Rembrandt was a friend of the Jewish community in Amsterdam, uh, but I uh, went to the Anne Frank Museum and found out there, uh, there was a lot of collaborators, you know, they turned in Anne Frank, so, uh, but at one point in time, the Dutch were very progressive, they uh, allowed free thought, you know, they protected, yes. I'm going to say it's a Nazi because it's diametrically opposite and it's a reference to and I'm saying that as intention but I, I like the idea people could interpret it different ways I'm not going to say my interpretation sticks uh, but I saw the um, as being diametrically opposite Judaism and Nazism not that everything's diametrically opposite there at one point in time the Christian church was diametrically opposed to the Muslim religion during the Crusades and such, so nothing sticks uh, except, I guess, Nazi versus Jew. Um, good question. Uh, plus, I threw in the Ice Age because I just thought, well, this is cold, you know, cold being uh, killing genocide. Kind of the Ice Age here, so I was in my Ice Age period. Uh, freedom, freedom requires blood. And then you have this, uh, I guess it's George Delator, something of a, uh, St. Sebastian, I think, but they have this fetid fountain. Another one of these, uh, mix them up. At the time, uh, most of, uh, what, this is Rome, yeah. Most of Rome is being reconstructed, deconstructed with scaffolding all around it, but then you treat those crystalline forms as something else, you get to uh, abstract them to some extent. Then I threw in a little rhinoceros for fun, you know, just to say, well, this is nothing sacred, you got the oriental thing going on where you just mix up cultures, and I want to make it all uh, just European. Uh, oh, I think that's the end point. So, ooh, I want to thank you a lot for coming here. Again, um, it took a lot of work. Uh, besides Alex, Jason helped my infirm uh, herniated body. I couldn't have hauled any of this in. So I want to thank everybody for coming. Hopefully you don't have a sore butt or a sore mind. All right. So any questions? Sir? You're free to leave, but if you have a question, you can ask a question. I don't want to keep anybody here longer than I want to be. Question. You do a lot of like spiritual, esoteric language and spiritual conversion. Is that something you've always been interested in? Or is that something that you came with intention, with like your meaning, or have you had to use it like a free for all? Yeah, um, I was raised Roman Catholic where I was going to go to hell no matter what. And I just figured. Everything's up for grabs once I uh, grew up, all right? My body took over. All right, go ahead. How did you uh, create those pieces or is it just you, like, seeing whatever? Yeah, eyeballing. Um, I tried to, the premise was visual phenomena, visual phenomena, visual phenomena is different than photography. So I tried to eyeball all that as much as possible. Now, I think this, the one called Scalding Wings, I actually, for the figure, my wife got sick of posing, so I took a photo of them. The cats don't stand still. 
Uh, but the room and all that, me, is actually eyeball or eyeballed. I had to paint myself lying down with the painting next to me, so plus my hand. And uh, so I, I love the uh, idea of the challenge of doing something like that. But again, GoPro, uh, if you ever have an endoscope, <laughs> they can make cameras. Oh, I won't go into my travails recently. Oh. So uh, <laughs> suffice it to, yeah, it's a long story that gets shorter and shorter. Question. Um, that's a good question. I don't know if it's an obstacle. I don't think, I never had trouble saying something. And when I was a little kid in grade school, a uh, nun came up to me and said, you can't make that hair orange. And I couldn't say the F word back then, but uh, suffice it to say, I just thought, I'm just gonna keep it orange. So I always thought I had something to say and I never ran out of things to say. And if I get bored, I just find something else to do. Now I tried out, I've done a lot of abstractions. I tried out different, I wouldn't touch sculpture, but I just figured there's a lot you can do. There's an infinite amount of things you could do as an artist. And I always thought as a political statement, the worst thing you could do as a teacher is impose your style on anybody. And so I, I looked at myself as having something to say, and I looked at my students as having something to say. And, um, I always felt bad for anybody that came to school that didn't have something to say, because I can't make you say something, you gotta say something. And that's where artistic longevity comes from. You know, you gotta make sure you have something to say. That's pretty much it. Anybody else, question? Yeah, well, we, I was at York Academy of Art and they decided to close it because they were private proprietary for profit run by a family. And the faculty wanted different things and they said, we don't like the faculty anymore. We're just gonna sell it to another operation and close out the faculty. We said, this is a month before the end of the school year, 40 years ago, almost exactly, you know, one month before. And we said, we're gonna form our own school, we're faculty. We don't need overpaid fa or administration for what they were doing. We could probably handle that ourselves. So we uh, knew some people in Marietta that needed facilities that were renovated or needing renovation that needed uh, to have a tenant uh, for their grant money to go through. And we got those connections. We spent the whole summer building furniture, getting administration together, getting our uh, some form of certification or accreditation and we opened in spring and the loyalty of the students to follow us and some of the students helped as founders to build some of the furniture to do things like that uh, it was a full-time job basically we had a job uh, making sure it was up and running and uh, we went on from there uh, when i started i uh, i was director of facilities and housing first and then i took on payroll took on all kinds of things um, benefits and I still had to do all facilities. I'd be the one out there shoveling the walk if it was, there was ice on the walk or something there, you know. So basically we had to pick up a lot of pieces and now we got running and now we're uh, 40 years hence and it's just a miracle to see where we came from and where we're at now. Um, I love the idea that our first computer came to the school about 82, maybe one year or one or two years after the first Apple came out. And it was kind of like the holy of holies, no one could touch it. And if you touch it, it was gonna break. And there was only one present using it now. Anyway, uh, now there's computers all over the place. I had to learn computers. Uh, I think back then uh, we had mimeograph machines. You know, all this, we had dinosaurs, they had pterodactyls we had to swat around. You know, there's all kinds of things we had going on. I invented the wheel, by the way. Well, you know, what do you know? Yes? Um, so, I know you say that whenever you just kind of get bored, you just do something else. Where do you see yourself like, right now? Like, uh, well, actually, I'm not exactly bored, but I'm just, I, I like to think I paint every day. I was painting uh, my woman friend's portrait just for something different because it's been a long time since I painted a portrait. So I started it yesterday, and I think I got a decent job on it. It's kind of uh, embarrassing to look at a portrait while you're doing it from life in the first hour, and then it gets better after the second hour, and you know, with each hour it gets better. So that's just a little bit of a challenge. I haven't done that. But it's still, um, 
There's a fine line between being too goofy and outrageous, which is what I'm trying to do without being goofy and outrageous. So I just have to tread that line. It's, you know, um, I think one person that steps over that line is maybe um, Cindy Sherman. Some of her photography gets a little bit too outrageous, you know, the puke ones and things like that. But, um, you know, it's kind of easy to be outrageous. And, but uh, it's a fine line to tread. Plus, I love art history and I love architecture. I love, I love history in general. I was just listening to a um, documentary on Benjamin Franklin and to say, God, that guy was so amazing. And I'm learning a lot. And so when I paint, I have a, sort of the jukebox of YouTube uh, videos going on. And uh, I educate myself. So I like to multitask. I've, I have a book called uh, Writings for Short Attention Spans, and that's what I have. And so while I work, I just kind of have two or three things, mostly educational videos going on that I could listen to. Uh, so that's how I keep myself amused. But um, I don't think I want to do some of the things I've done in the past. I don't want to do on-site landscapes. That doesn't interest me. I, I think there's more to say with these uh, bizarre color compositions, um, something about spiritual forces and then uh, history, uh, just in juxtaposed cultures. Question. How do you feel about working with Heather Snap? I'm sorry, repeat that? How do you feel about working with Heather Snap? Oh, I think, well, again, it's a miracle where it started. I've been away, I took care of my dear wife. Uh, she had dementia. I took care of her for you. And, uh, you know, I was away for four years, and now I'm back. And it's just beautiful to see what's happened. The, the new president. I, I love just the fact of everything that happens um, for where it was and where it is today. So um, uh, I almost feel like a stranger in a strange land because I don't know any of the students, but I know a lot of the faculty and staff. So, and uh, unfortunately, you know, with COVID, I haven't popped my head in. And it's just a, you know, a real blessing to uh, be called upon uh, for the founders to have this show, this lecture. I wasn't expecting any, but I just called upon doing it. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a real, you know, unexpected honor. So, thank you, thank you. Any other questions? I'll recover. <laughs> okay, you did your work. You, you, you went through my lectures and you saw my show. I want to thank you for all coming here and uh, do great work. That's your job, number one. Nothing. Be creative spirits. <laughs>